right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, whether you're in the sanctuary here with us, we're still practicing social distancing. Or if you're watching at home, I'm glad that you can join us here in IFGF Seattle. This is a big, big family. And, uh, you know, it's crazy. It's been nine months now that since we practice social dis distancing. And uh, no matter how long we have been in this kind of situation, it never get uh, becoming something that is normal, something that we feel that, oh, okay, it's, it's something that we're used to. It still feels very strange to me. And uh, I'm, bet that I'm willing to bet that like many, uh, many of you guys that are watching uh, right now in your couch, in your home, in your warm conven convenience of your house, you know, you still long for that relationship. You still long to meet with uh, your community. And uh, we're all in this together. And I believe that we're this close, uh, basically, about reaching the end of this whole uh, chaos. Uh, some great news came over the week that we, s we have, like, a, an effective vaccine that is about to be approved by the FDA. So that is a very exciting news. And I'm, uh, I'm really hoping that we can push this through together and uh, come out of, out of this situation together as a winner. Amen? I cannot wait for a normal, some sort of norm, normalcy to uh, return into our lives and have the sanctuary basically packed again with people because it kind of feels strange sometimes like speaking in an empty room, like the echo is the thing that you will hear back out of your own voice. And, uh, you know... I just meet, uh, miss meeting with people. Uh, doesn't really matter whether you're extrovert, introvert. Uh, I think like we all need to have like some sor sort of uh, social life. Amen. All right, I can hear myself. Amen. All right. So uh, this month we're gonna talk about the message in, into the topic that you know December is always being correlated with this topic, and I believe that there's a good reason behind it. Uh, we're going to talk about Christmas in us. Christmas in us. December is, is the month of Christmas. And if you're driving around right now, you will start seeing like your neighbor decorating their houses. As a matter of fact, I noticed that during uh, this whole pandemic, people tend to decorate their houses even more compared to normal, normal uh, holiday season. You will start seeing decoration here uh, and there. And... Uh, Kids, my kids are looking forward for like present. Uh, we don't have a tree this, this time around because uh, we need to rip off the flooring and we're going to change it this year. But they don't really care about the tree. All that they care about is the present. But Christmas is much more than uh, lights, trees, and present. I believe that Christmas is really a message of breakthrough. If you really think about it, uh, for the longest time in the Old Testament, there's no such thing of the concept of Christmas. There's none. And after for so long and thousands and thousands of years that happens during the Old Testament, and suddenly, suddenly the New Testament happened, and that is the moment that Christmas begins. The story of Christmas is the, the story of a change that happens. And as a matter of fact, the Christmas is actually a story of breakthrough. If you take a look into the Old and New Testament, actually there's a big, big period of quiet and silent times. And I think I, I'd like to refer this as a time of silence, a time of depression, a time of where God seems to not say anything to his people. And there's about like 400 years between the uh, book of Malachi and the uh, story of John the Baptist, story of Christmas story of uh, the, the, the story where Jesus was born. And 400 years is a long time. And the most difficult part, you know, out of a whole situation is when you are being in a situation where you feel defeated and God just seems to be silent in your life. It, it is just a story of depression in this case. It is mentioned that 400 years, heaven went quiet, there's no recorded uh, miracles, no messages, no breakthroughs, and Romans ruled over Israel instead of Israel rising up. I think that that's a big story of depression. You know, when you're having a fight with your significant others, I think like the worst thing that can happen to you is if there's a silent treatment. If there's no word, I really cannot handle it. Silence is the worst. 
And maybe you can relate with that because like you got to keep on guessing what is going on within this relationship. What is going on? Because everything just seems to be quiet. You know, it's the worst. But suddenly, during this moment where everything seems to be crumbling apart, where everything seems to be silent and you don't know where things are heading, actually God is preparing for the greatest miracle to happen in our lives. This is the story of Christmas. That during the 400 years, God is preparing for His way, for the breakthrough, for the promises that He has given to us, which is Jesus Christ, to be delivered in our lives. You know, during those 400 years, actually during the Roman rule, there's a common language that, that was introduced into the society. That is the Greek language. And this allows for the good news to spread from one place to another and to be understood by the entire humankind. Without this, I don't think that the message of Christmas will reach to us here and now today. And the other thing is that during this, that uh, 400 years of silence, God is preparing like road. Road uh, was before invested by thieves and it wasn't really safe to travel back then. And during this 400 years where God seems to be silent, God is actually carefully orchestrating for ways to happen and to be delivered to all the people in the planet. So the lesson to be learned here is that God's silence is not the same with God's absence. And today... I don't know if God seems to be really silent maybe in your life. Maybe it feels like you've been asking for breakthrough and you've been struggling with this whole pandemic or your whole situation right now today. You know, maybe there are like other cases. Maybe it doesn't deal with this pand uh, pandemic that everybody's talking about. But there, uh, if there's any struggle in your life that you're, that you're currently you feel like, God, you just seems to be really quiet in my life. I don't know where things are heading. It feels like I'm losing my battle. It feels like you're not saying anything. It just feels so frustrating in my life. I want you to know that even in the midst of your silences, God is not absent in your life. Maybe He's preparing you and I for a breakthrough. Maybe we've been misunderstanding that His silence means His absence. But I want us to be encouraged knowing that God is not absent in our lives. Amen. And today I want to talk about watchful thinking in the message of Christmas. Because how many of you know that um, in order for us to be able to grasp the breakthrough, we need to be able to react to where God is leading us. We need to be able to know where God is leading us. Even though things seem to be quiet, we need to be watchful. Whenever things are happening, hey, we need to respond immediately. And a lot of times, it's so difficult to stay attentive, to stay watchful, because we have like this thing that is called attention decay. How many of you can share this uh, feeling with me that it's easy sometimes like to, to pay attention initially, but over time, as you're paying attention, your attention is just going down the chart, down, 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 down to the bottom, you know? How many of you during this COVID uh, age and time, you can relate when you're having a Zoom meeting, when you're having an online meeting, it's just so darn hard for you to keep your focus there on the screen and watching for the presentation or watching during the meeting, especially, especially in, if there's a lot of people in that meeting and you have barely have any uh, chance to talk, you know? You're just listening. You're just having a team sync or you're just meeting with a bunch of people and uh, sometimes the, the meeting doesn't feel really that relevant to you. And you're just zooming out. Your mind is just checking out. How many of you can relate with me? Right? And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, recently I just did some uh, experiment. I found out that uh, Zoom or whatever online meeting, uh, you can basically change your background. You know? So I took a snapshot of myself in front of the camera and uploaded as my background... And then after that, I went away and I'm trying to realize like how many people will actually realize that I'm actually not in front of the screen. And uh, true enough, like I forgot about uh, the, my background uh, when it comes my turn to speak. Suddenly people see two versions of me and I'm busted, of course. Like, but 
It is true that keeping attention is a difficult thing. Especially, you know, when things seem to be monotone, when things doesn't seem to be going your way, when things seem to be just going for a long period of time. And that's just, that's not just uh, unique to one or two person, but I think that this problem is unique to each one of us. That keeping and staying focused, staying, staying watchful is a difficult thing. As a matter of fact, there's the story here in the Bible, in Matthew 25, verse 1 until 13. There's this story about ten, the ten virgins. And um, I think like many of us, we heard about this story before, but let's just read it out together. Matthew 25, verse 1 until 13. At the time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five, the, five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish one took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise one, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming. And they all become drowsy and they fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, here the bridegroom, come out and to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil, please. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. They may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, Go to those who sell oil and buy some yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were out, who were ready, went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. And the rest was history. And I feel like this story, we read it a lot of times, and we always, uh, you know, sometimes it's being interpreted, uh, being, being mentioned that this is the story of hell. That when you're not ready, you're going to hell. But I believe that this is so much more. This is talking about being wise and foolish. And there's a big, big thing that I want us to pay attention here. Is that the message behind this verse is to stay watchful of what God is about to deliver in their lives. Because both, all the ten virgins, you know, the, the five and five, the, the different group, they both have the same calling. They both have the same opportunity. But what group missed out on their opportunity while the others basically gain it? And it is really interesting to, to look into it here. That they were not called foolish because of their lack of morality. It has nothing to do with the morality within the story. And it has nothing to do with the relationship to the bride and groom. They were all invited as part of the party. But five were prepared and five were not. Five had the mentality, had the watchful thinking, being ready for anything. Because uh, if you know the culture back then, most wedding happened at night. And if you know the culture back then, they don't have lights. They don't have lamps. Edison was not around. So a lamp with oil was a necessity. They know it. But five were unwise. They didn't anticipate for the long wait that might happen, for things that might occur. And they just went on carrying with them with whatever they thought this, that is enough. And it turns out that they did not finish their journey because they did not have this watchful thinking. The difference between wishful thinking and watchful thinking is that wishful thinking, you can imagine, you can expect a lot of things. But a watchful thinking is that you're expecting for a great thing and you're prepared for those great things that God is about to give to you. And I believe and I want to encourage each one of us, you know, we all can believe that God has a breakthrough. We all can hope for, for a breakthrough uh, from God. But don't just expect, you know, don't just expect, but I want us to anticipate. There's a big difference between anticipation and expectation. You know, and this is not just uh, within the language. You know, let's bring it out. Expectation, uh, both came from Latin word. Expectation comes from the word ex and spectre, which means out and looking at, looking outside, awaiting, you know. 
you're looking for something outside and you're waiting for it. You're, uh, people are just talking about expectation with the excitement. Uh, it ha actually doesn't really have anything to do with excitement, but a lot of times it is being correlated with the word, expecta uh, with the word excitement. Expectation is just you're looking for something that is outside and you're waiting for it to happen. It's a very passive word. It means that you're just waiting passively for something to occur. You, you know something is about to occur and you're just waiting. Come, come, come. All right? But the word anticipation comes from, from the word ante, which means front, ahead, beforehand, and capere, to take, to take beforehand what is in front of you. You take the victory ahead of you before the time even comes. That is what it means. You say what is about to happen and you take it beforehand because you know it's going to happen. You know it takes some effort. You know there's an act of participation that needs and re being required out of us to do. It's not just a passive act, but it is an active act of being watchful, of being, an, uh, of being observant of what's about to happen. And you adjust your course, you're preparing for that, and you're taking it beforehand, even before it happens. And I think like the Word of God, the Bible, and a lot of times when people are preaching the great expectation, really what they're meant is the great anticipation. Because I believe that God doesn't call us to be passive. God doesn't call us to wait and see and just do nothing. But a lot of times when the, when the Bible is talking about faith, it talks about like faith without works is that it is talking about anticipation. I believe that our faith is not a passive work, but our faith is an active work. Where when we're seeing something that is, that is not right, we need to do something about it and not just wait. But sadly, I think that a lot of Christian motto is just pray. It's just wait. Don't get me wrong. It's not that I don't believe in prayer. I believe in prayer, but I do believe in a good works too. I believe in pushing hard. I believe in getting involved. So the key behind here is that if you want to stay watchful, you have to stay engaged. And if you want to stay engaged, you know, you have to participate. You have to take a portion of a stake. You have to be a part of the work. Unless if you're doing the work, unless if you're participating, you're not going to be engaged. And if you're not engaged, you're not going to be watchful. Our attention span is just going to go down and down and down. It's just who we are. It's just how we are wired. So what, what does it mean for, for us today? It means that if you're right now not being participated, if you're not participating, you know, in, a, in God's work or in things that you care about in your community, I'm guaranteeing you that your attention span and your heart is just going to go down and down and down. You're, you will eventually miss and you will eventually lose that spark that you have in your heart, you know. Something that used to burn you inside of your heart. Cases, uh, scenarios, things that you care about are just going to slowly get down and down and downhill. So I want to invite you. If you're not participating right now in God's work, you know, and you believe that it is important, it's time for us to take a stake so that we will stay engaged and being watchful in what God has for you and I. So, now that we're talking about the external thing that we got to participate, but I believe also like internally there are things that are really important that we got to do to stay engaged and to be st uh, watchful. I like this verse. And a lot of times, you know, when we're reading the, the book of Revelation, it's kind of con a confusing, confusing uh, book. How many of you can relate? Like, sometimes I have no freaking idea what it's talking about. It's just so cryptic. Uh, it's just so weird sometimes. And a lot of uh, people like to have, like, a weird interpretation out of it. But there's this uh, beginning of the book of Revelation that I think that it's pretty cool, especially if you understand the culture. If you understand uh, who were the receiver of this book. Because it provides a lot of insight, and I, I, I just thought that the whole history behind the, the insight is pretty cool. It is in Revelation 3, verse 1 until 2. It is written here, To the angel of the church in Sardis, write, 
These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. You know? And that's just the beginning of the word. And I thought that it's kind of interesting that it talks about like, hey, we, you have a good reputation of being alive, but you're dead. And then after that, it doesn't provide a lot of details why they have that, such a good rep, uh, such a rap like that. But if you look into the history, and I think like a lot of people who received that word back then immediately understands. Because Sardis is a famous, famous story that happens in around 547 BC. This happens before Jesus' time. And Sardis was actually a very famous city because it is well fortified. It is well fortified. They, they, uh, it is almost impossible to penetrate. Actually, even ancient history, uh, ancient prophecy says that this city will never be captured by anyone. It's the strongest city ever. It's on top of the hill. It's hard. I mean, like, if you want to charge it, you have to walk uphill. And we know how it feels walking uphill. It's not that easy. People who are uphill has the advantage. You cannot shoot them with arrow up there. It's difficult, and people from up there can easily just throw rocks at you. It's a very strong fortified city, and they also have a strong allies. It is said that uh, Croesus, the king over Lydian, in, uh, that, is, uh, that is hiding behind the city of Sardis, he got allies from Spartans, Egyptians, Babylonians. Those are really strong, strong allies. We all have watched the 300 Spartans, such a cool movie. I don't know. I'm just a big fan of, of like, this is Sparta. It never gets old to me. <laughs> you can imagine that they have like such a strong ally that every single attempt from Cyrus to conquer the city always failed. Zero success. Always, every time they went up, they failed. Every time they went up, they failed. This is such a strong city. Until Cyrus tries to convince his troop, hey, whoever can go up there first, who, whoever can go climb and, and open the city for us, they will be greatly rewarded. And one time, a Persian soldier, after so many times of failed attempt, they were just observing the wall. And they observed that there's this one section of the wall that it's really steep, you know. When, when it's really steep, it's really difficult to go up. And sometimes it's even impossible to climb. They're just observing, like, imagining. I can only imagine if I can go, go up to, to that uh, city. We've been camping here trying to attack the city so many times and we keep on failing. And they're just watching there. At one night... It is reported that the soldier observed a Lydian soldier. So the, the soldier that is basically guarding the city dropped his helmet from the top of the wall to the bottom. Huh. Interesting. Because the soldier not only dropped his helmet, but apparently after that, he was looking left and right. And then after that, starts climbing down the very steep part of the wall to retrieve his helmet. That night, this Persian soldier learned that although this, a, this is a very steep part of the city, very difficult to climb. There's a trick of climbing it, and he's just observing it of how typically people will climb up and down to retrieve their helmet. Apparently, this is not just a one-time happening, but apparently things fall, that the soldiers know how to retrieve things down there and not, not going like, uh-oh, there goes the helmet, time to get a new one. They know, oh, there's a trick of climbing down. You know, helmets are expensive. Let's save our money and just retrieve it. And this is the story, uh, this is the story how the Persian finally learned how to climb up the wall, get in the city, open the gate, and conquer the city that was impenetrable. The city that was strong and fortified, that was all secure from any angles, that never fell a, uh, a single time, fell that day because of a part that was never guarded. And this is not new happening in their lives. This is not a ha new happening in the city. 
they kind of knew about it. But they just kind of assume that the, everything is fine. Everything is impossible. There's nothing that you can uh, do to, to de defeat the city. And a lot of times, you know, in our Christian life, I think that it's so easy for us to go in that direction. We're just getting way too accustomed in our faith that we do not ask ourselves really how strong our faith, how our spiritually uh, how our spirituality, spirituality is with God. We didn't ask about it. And the enemy knows the weak points because like we keep on climbing down every now and then. But we didn't realize because when people are not being watchful, you know, when people are not testing their own thing, when people are not trying to convict their self, when people are not validating uh, themselves with the word of God, you know, we will have holes, we will have cracks, we will have parts in our lives that are weak. And sometimes those are the parts that will be compromised. And sometimes it's really hard to see it, you know. Um, earlier this year, I went hiking with my family. And... Uh, how many of you, whenever that you're going hiking, you just, the most important thing that you bring with you is your phone fully charged and probably some food and water, right? And the problem uh, that I encountered back then while I was hiking, as we're going up, we're trying to go north. But the more north that we're going, it seems like the map shows us the more south that we end up. It's just so strange. And, I, and we keep on walking. We, we think like, ah, we must be crazy. Let's keep on going north. We walk two miles. And then it turns out in our map, we see that, hey, how come we're two miles south than where we started initially? So we start looking at the sun. And we start uh, using the compass that God created, which is the sun. And we realize that our phone, actually my phone, did not work. Because we're only using one phone. My, uh, my wife's phone is dead because she took too many pictures. You know, Instagram, not worth it, fun. Compass, more important. And that sparks my curiosity. How is it possible that new phone, you know, it's not a phone back from the year 2007. It's not a BlackBerry, you know. Who uses BlackBerry anymore? You, can, you need to repent. It's a new phone. But how is it that the compass, it seems that it's having issues, that it doesn't even know that I'm wa walking to two miles south. It reported uh, that I'm trying to walk two miles north. It says that I'm trying to walk north, but how come I end up south? Sparks my curiosity. And it turns out that every now and then, a phone compass will go out of calibration. And, you know... You can see in the screen, sometimes it, it asks you to, to move your phone in a number eight, reverse infinite direction. You know, it's kind of strange. Why do I have to move my phone in the, such a weird pattern? I just look so dumb. This is not cool. But the reason behind it is that if you understand how a compass works, it works by reading the magnetic pole, uh, the magnetic field of the earth. And a lot of times, the internal components of the, the phone, you know, it has a lot of electronics. If you didn't know it, know it already, inside of your phone, there's a battery. Such a revelation that we have today, you know. And there's also like magnets out of, out of the speakers, out of the microphones. There are other components that are also generating magnetic fields. And the phone usually knows about the internal because it stays within the phone. But every now and then it gets confused. It, gets calibra it, it lost its track of which one is the internal uh, magnetic fields and which one are from the earth. So when you move it up around, it will relearn how to distinguish which one is just internal and which one is the true north, which one is the the true uh, voice that it needs to report, which one is the true voice that it needs to recognize. And it's the same thing with us, right? We all have this internal voices within us, and sometimes we get confused. We have our own perception of reality that sometimes distorts the value that God has for us. A lot of times, you know... Um, my parents like to take like whatever news that they can find on Facebook or on WhatsApp. 
that must be the real thing. I don't know what's wrong with parents today. Uh, don't, don't tell my parents about that. But I think like most of us, we can relate. That it's hard to distinguish which one is the true voice and which one is fake news. Is social media the reality because the, we're bombarded with the social media and it, they, the messages tend to be like very hip and we can relate with it and it must be true, right? Until last election, we, we were told that, hey, somebody is trying to meddle with the election and we know that social media is not always the true source of news. The problem really with today is that if you do not listen to the news, you are uninformed. But if you're listening to the news, sometimes we are misinformed. And it is very important for us to calibrate our intake so we know the true north. What is our true value? What is the true direction that we need to go to? But a lot of times we do not take time for us to calibrate and to, to really find out which one actually is the voice, the magnetic pole that I need to follow. And I want to invite us, if we want to stay being watchful, if we want to stay engaged, I think it is a very important time for us to calibrate ourselves, to really learn which one is the voice of truth, which one is my true north, right? And that's, I think, like the whole reason why we're reading the Bible. I think that's the whole reason why we're being plugged inside of a community. That's the whole reason sometimes we have to ask the hard questions because sometimes even the most Christian-like kind of statement can be a wrong kind of statement. The most Christian-like kind of statement and the way kind of thinking that, hmm, feels right. Just follow your faith, just follow your heart. Sometimes it's actually the wrong advice. We need to validate it. Is it consistent with the Word of God? Is it consistent? Don't just use your feeling but use your reference, the Word of God, as your true north, right? Because our feeling can lie, our feeling can tell us whatever. Our feeling is like our compass that sometimes got, uh, got compromised with the voices around us. And it's time for us to calibrate it every now and then. And I think that that's so darn important. And let me close this uh, sermon with the... Well, we kind of skipped like one verse, which I really like before we go, go to the final. Here in 1 Thessalonians uh, 5, verse, uh, 5, chapter 5, and verse 21, it says, But test everything, hold fast what is good. And I really like this verse because this is a good verse for every engineer. Uh, you are required to test everything. This is a principle uh, that is being taken by the engineering world. If you're geekish enough, you kind of can appreciate this verse. It says test everything, but it is crazy. The amount of testing that every engineering company needs to do. You might just develop like one feature, but you will have a thousand testing for that feature. And that is a well-known thing because we know anything that can go wrong will go wrong until you validate it and you minimize that risk. But I think it, it is true. Test everything that, ha that is happening in your life. Make sure, bring it in front of God. God is, is the voices in my heart here is true. And let God test it. Because I believe this is the way for us to stay engaged in, in what God is trying to do. And let me really, really, for the last time, close it with this. If anything, if you forgot about anything that I said, I think that this is the most important point. That the Word of God is saying how we all should stay engaged how the Word of God wants the church of Sardis to stay engaged. It says this, the continuation in Revelation 3. It says, wake up. Wake up! Snap out! Strengthen what remains and is about to die. Remember what you have received and heard. Hold it fast. And repent and I really like this because it provides us with such an insight when it says that strengthen what remains and is about to die it gives us a clue 
that it is a process of decay. You know, being watchful, our spirituality state is not today we're spiritual, tomorrow we're not. Our value system is not like binary where one day it's zero, uh, one, tomorrow is zero. It's a continuation. It's a process where it's decaying slowly. And it happens with small little compromises that happens in our lives. And maybe today we're in that situation where pressure has been pressuring us so hard that we started thinking about maybe I need to compromise a little bit. And maybe that's not, the, typically that's not the voice that we have saying uh, in ourselves, right? Let's compromise. I never say that to myself. Let's compromise. But typically it will go like, maybe it's a little bit easy. Maybe it's okay if I do so and so. Maybe it's okay for me to stop paying attention to so and so. Maybe you're right now in that road where you're feeling that pressure is so hard and you're ready to say, like, maybe it's easier for me. Yeah, to ignore this relationship a bit. To ignore my parents, to ignore my spouse, to ignore my future, to ignore children, to ignore fill in the blanks. Maybe it's a thing that you've been doing all this time, but maybe right now it's the economy that is pushing you. You feel like maybe it's easier not to tithe. Maybe it's easier not to give. Maybe it's easier just to pay attention to myself and not to anything else. Maybe we're in that path. And the Word of God is saying that, wake up. And when it says repent, and re it doesn't really talk about like, hey, you must be a sinner. It, it doesn't have to be a big sin. It doesn't have to be something that is extreme. Because the word repent itself means to turn around from the decision that you made. To have a remorse about the decision that you have entertained within your heart. And to make a decision that I'm not going to take that decision. But I'm going to go the other way around. And I really like this verse because it says that reinforce. It speaks about taking what you already have in existence, something that is feeble, something that is weak. It says, I'm not going to dismiss it. I'm not going to say that it's bad and it's hopeless. But it says that there is something that you can do to strengthen, to restore, to make it new again. And I believe that's the reason why God placed you in the community of church. Because God wants us to realize that we're not alone. Maybe you're in a path of destruction of your life. That you are feeling right now that the only thing that matters right now is just to feel better. And you're about ready to abuse your own body, to abuse your own heart. Maybe with substances, maybe with other things. And today God is saying that strengthen what you have left. Do not take that path. And maybe for you, it's time for us to reach to somebody in our community. For some of us, maybe it's just a decision that we got to change. But for some of us, it means reaching out. And I believe that God has in place this church, leaders around us, or maybe even that you're a leader. God has placed you in a family. And maybe it's time for us to open up and have outside help to help us strengthen whatever that is left. That is the course of action that I want us to take. Because remember, and I really believe, this is not just about like this whole year is almost done. But I believe that even during this silence moment where things seem to be really quiet and God is missing out of the picture, He's preparing for something great. But it is our duty to anticipate and get ready to react to what He's about to bring in our lives. Because it's going to be worth it. It's going to be beautiful in the end. But it takes us to respond. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we just want to thank you. You're a good God.
And today is a message that we got to be reminded that Christmas is not just a story about a party, about fun times. It is so much more than that. That Christmas to all of us believers is the story of breakthrough. It's a story of a Savior that's been promised for the longest time. And then, instead of things going on as what we wanted, it seems that things are going actually downhill. And it seems that you're quiet, and it seems that everything, Father, is falling apart. But during those times, you're preparing, Father, for your gift not only to come, but also to be sustained and bear the results that you wanted. So today, as we're listening to to your word, let us be reminded again that Christmas is a story of breakthrough. And your uh, your plan in our lives, Father, is is a plan of breakthrough. You're not planning for evil. But your plan in our lives is a plan of breakthrough, of, of happiness, Father, of joy. That's what you have in mind. And right now, Father, even if we have lost hope, let us be reminded again that we are not abandoned. It might be that you are quiet. It might be that you are silent. But you're not absent in our lives. So help us to be watchful. Help us to strengthen whatever that is weakened right now. Revive us, Father, from the place that we're in. Revive us, Father, because revival starts within the heart. Revival is not a big party. It's not a big event. It's not a big church celebration. A revival starts within the heart. A revival starts within the heart where things that are dying comes back to alive, where values that are dying, where values that are slowly decaying comes back, turning around to the other side, Father. That is what revival is. Start within us. Help us to stay watchful that we will not miss the great movement that you have for us. We thank you, Lord. Seal it in our hearts. And if you're watching right now from home and you feel like, Yep, I'm in that situation. There are things that are about to die in my life. I'm about to give up. And I just I just need to have some support. I just need some help. I want you to take the step and to give to reach out to the church, to the community around you. Because there's no shame about it. We all need help. I need help. Everybody needs help. I want you to reach out. And go out through this whole problem together. And I hope and I know that we will reach into the point of breakthrough out together. Victorious. All right. Thank you everybody for watching. And in Jesus' mighty name, we all pray. Amen.